The runtime fabric deployment model allows us to deploy containerized Mule applications in a Kubernetes cluster. Since containers, virtual machines, and Kubernetes are the core concepts involved in runtime fabric, it's important that we have basic understanding of the concepts and terminologies involved. This primer series helps in addressing those requirements. There are two parts in the primer series for RTF. In part one, I've explained virtualization and containerization. And in part two, I've explained the basics of Kubernetes. As usual, the video timestamps are placed in the description below so that you can easily navigate across different section of this video. So let's get started. Virtualization is basically the root of all the cloud-based technologies that we have today. Let's first understand why do we need virtualization? So here's a compute device. It could be a laptop, PC or a bare metal server. Every device has hardware components like SSD, RAM, IO devices, network interface cards and CPU, which can be leveraged for various computational activities. To leverage this hardware components, we install an operating system. This OS can host applications to perform various tasks based on the user's requirement. The operating system has kernel whose job is to expose a set of APIs that would help the apps hosted on the operating system to leverage the underlying resource. Now assume you want to run a Mule application which has an HTTP listener listening on port 80. So once you deploy this app under the hood, it will communicate with the kernel and get the port 80 registered with the network interface and from the interface the hardware will take care of it so we have blocked port 80 on an interface in the machine later you decide to deploy another app which again has an http listener listening to port 80 now it would fail to deploy because port 80 is already blocked by the previous application. So how do we solve this problem? One way could be to use another port, but since it's a web server, you do not want to use any other port instead of port 80. Other option could be to deploy the app on a different machine. This solution will work, but it is not at all economical as provisioning a new machine just to run a single web app is an expensive affair. This was one such example wherein we were dealing with conflicts of for resources consumption. There could be multiple such situation. For example, deploying an app which needs .NET version 1.2 and there's another app which needs .NET version 1.0 and both the versions of .NET cannot run simultaneously on a single machine. Or another instance could be uh, an antivirus. No two different antivirus can run on a single operating system at the same time. So basically what these apps are demanding is an isolation of resources wherein these apps can have exclusive access to the underlying hardware, thereby resolving the conflicts. Virtualization helps us to achieve the same thing. So let's understand what is virtualization. So virtualization works by hosting multiple operating systems on a single hardware. And these multiple operating systems are called as virtual machines. This is achieved by using a component called as hypervisor. The job of the hypervisor is to trick the operating system or the guest operating system in believing that it has an exclusive access to the underlying hardware, whereas in reality it doesn't. Hypervisor can be of two types, type 1 and type 2. The one that you see in the diagram is type 2 hypervisor because it's installed on an operating system. This operating system is also known as the host operating system 
then there are other operating system which are installed on top of it which are also known as guest operating system or virtual machines the other type of hypervisor is the type 1 hypervisor which is also known as bare metal hypervisor this hypervisor is installed directly on the server so in type 1 you do not install os first but installed directly the hypervisor on the hardware and then install the guest operating systems okay back to our original story now that we have two guest operating systems we can deploy each mule application to a single operating system and both can listen on port 80 because they are now isolated but wait what about the network in this case the hypervisor will ensure that a new network interface is created and it will be a virtual network and each of the guest OS gets its own share of ports and IP addresses which can be accessed from the host operating system as well as the guest operating system and vice versa but what if someone wants to access the web servers outside the host operating system basically from some other machine which is within the same physical network as that of this host OS or the host machine well in that case you would need an app with routing rules to direct the traffic to the guest OS IP address something similar to a load balancer now we won't delve into the details of this because it's beyond the scope of this video okay so now things look good and we are able to run our application without any problem as they now have isolated environment to run but Having a full-fledged operating system to run only a single app is a bit expensive because an operating system has lot many components which our app might not need. For example, UI, camera device drivers, sound driver, etc. This piece of software consume resources which are actually not needed for the working of our application. So now our requirement is that we still need isolation which we are, have attained in virtualization but we also need a lightweight operating system which is void of any unnecessary bloatwares and drivers. So let's see how we can achieve this requirement. So the solution to this problem is containerization. Let's understand what is containerization. We have the same virtualization diagram. Let's modify this a bit. Let's get rid of the guest OS kernel and the hypervisor. But then how do we manage resources without kernel and hypervisor? Well, let's introduce Docker runtime and a Docker daemon. Both of them together will help fill the void left by removing guest OS kernel and hypervisor. Since we removed kernels from the guest operating system, they no longer remain guest OS. We would rather call them as image OS, which is basically a minimal version of a full-fledged operating system with only essential binaries and libraries required to run the apps. And this image OS is also void of a kernel. The image OS, when run on a Docker runtime, takes a form of a container. All the underlying resource requests are now routed to the host operating system's kernel via the docker daemon. So this solution helps us to get rid of the heavyweight guest operating system which is really not required to run a simple applications. Now we have a container made out of an image OS which is a lightweight version of the original OS like Windows, Linux, etc. And it has only minimal libraries and binaries. The boot time of these containers reduce significantly as they do not have their own kernel 
but rather rely on the Docker daemon. Now let's delve a bit into the details of the image OS and how it eventually runs as a container. All the Docker images start with a base image which are publicly available. These images can be retrieved from public container registry. For example, Alpine is one such Docker image that has Linux OS with Java installed in it. Now be aware that these images won't have any kernel. Now using this base image, we can create a new image which will have our app and its associated libraries on top of it. In our case, we first install Mule Runtime and then deploy a Mule app to it. All of this can be specified with a set of commands in a Docker file and an image can be created using a Docker client. So it's the base image on top of that, the Mule Runtime and finally the Mule app and you export this as a image using a Docker client and publish it to a container registry. Now, please note that in reality, the image OS for Mule app on RTF is quite different than the one shown here. This is just for explanation purpose. However, the principle remains the same. Next in the Docker runtime, this image can be pulled from the registry and can be ran to create a container out of it. And that's how a base image gets converted to a custom image and eventually ends up being deployed as a container. Now, the container has its own set of disk space, RAM, ports and IP address which is isolated from the other containers. This also implies that if you store any data on the persistent storage exclusive to the container, it gets wiped off once the container is stopped or crashed. So if there is a need of storing persistent data, it should not be done inside the file system of the container, but it should be done on some other persistent storage outside the container. One important point before we move ahead, Docker relies on isolation of resources and such isolation can be achieved by using technique like namespacing and control groups. Now namespacing defines which segment or part of a resource should be isolated. For example, isolating a particular segment of a hard disk for a container, maybe even network and so on. Whereas control group defined the amount to be isolated. For example, isolating 10 gigs of disk space on a particular segment of that hard disk. Now these techniques are only available in the Linux operating system and hence Docker runs natively on the Linux operating system. Operating systems like Windows and Mac OS do not have this uh, capability. So in that case, whenever you install uh, Docker, it first installs Linux and then installs the Docker runtime along with its daemon. So it can be seen in the diagram. Uh, I have a hardware laptop or PC on top of it, there is a Windows operating system installed already, but since Docker isn't supported natively, when I install Docker, the guest OS, which is the Linux operating system, gets installed. And on top of the Linux operating system, the Docker runtime along with its daemon is installed. And all the communication of the container happens via the Docker daemon to the Linux kernel from the Linux kernel to the hypervisor. Now hypervisor comes because it's virtualization, right? We have another operating system on top of the original operating system, which is Windows in this case. And from the hypervisor, it goes to the kernel, eventually to the actual underlying resource. That we have understood the two important concepts. Let's try to fit this in one frame. 
one confusion that would have come to your mind. At least I had this confusion when I started to grasp these concepts. It is that if containerization is better than virtualization, then what is the relevance that virtualization holds now? Is it even being used these days? Well, the answer to this question is yes. Virtualization is still used widely today. You see, containerization platforms like Docker work on a runtime and this runtime relies on Linux for reasons we discussed previously. So basically, you need a base operating system to host these containers. But then one might argue that if a base operating system is needed, then why not just assign a server with Linux installed on it and then we can install containerization platform on top of it. So there's no need of virtualization now, right? Well, this makes sense only if it is for personal use. You need to think from a commercial standpoint. If you are a cloud provider, you cannot assign your customers physical servers for them to just install Docker and this isn't feasible practically. What you would rather do is set up a few beefy servers and virtualize multiple operating systems on it. This way, you share one single machine with multiple customers or maybe even create a farm of servers and provide it to customers at scale. This way, you save the cost of setting up dedicated physical machines for every single customer or their requirement. Hence, virtualization is very relevant even after the advent of containerization platforms. And it serves a specific set of requirements. Amazon's EC2 instance is a classic example of virtualization. So now let's sum up everything that we have learned so far. We start with the physical hardware, that is a bare metal server. In the diagram, it's represented as hardware, laptop, PC, which has all required components like SSD, RAM, IO devices, network devices, and CPU, of course. On top of it, we install hypervisor. Now hypervisor could be type one, type two, and on this hypervisor, using this hypervisor, we can basically virtualize multiple operating system on it. So here we have two Linux VM, which are uh, installed on top of this hypervisor. And on each Linux VM, you can install Docker. And on top of the Docker runtime, you install Docker containers. So this is how virtualization and containerization go hand in hand and help us to achieve resource isolation. So that's it for this video. I hope you found the content useful. Thanks for watching.